Here we go. All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We've got a special guest with us, Shaniqua. Tell us about our guest. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, LCA. How are you? I am so excited to be here this morning, and I hope that all of you are excited. Well, some some of you, it's a uh, good afternoon. Right. <laughs> Let's get the formalities out the way. Um, um, I'm so excited about what we are bringing you today. One of the things that we all know is there can be some very colorful discussion in lab code agents around discrimination, bias, um, systemic racism, specifically as it relates to our industry. Um, one of the things I, I appreciate from Tristan is he inboxed me and he said, Shaniqua, we have to get our arms around this. How do we get our arms around this? And do you know anybody else we could bring in to lead a discussion that could help us bridge the gap around some of the inequalities that we experience in our industry? And I said, I think I have the right person in mind. One second, hold that thought. So I reached out, sent out an email, and I have to tell you all that one of my favorite books to read and one of my favorite books to refer to people when they get into this business is The Color of Law. Um, and so I'm so excited to be able to introduce to all of you today's guest for our session today. Richard, welcome to the largest online community for real estate agents. Welcome to Lab Code Agents. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be with you today. I look forward to this conversation. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, we're really excited that you're here because... You know, as real estate professionals, uh, this book for me has really resonated. And by the way, let me just hold up a copy of the book, The Color of Law. Uh, we also have a link to the book that we're going to be sharing with you guys. Um, and it's a book that as real estate professionals, there's no, there's no exception that this is something that you have to read. And this is something that you have to refer to. Um, and you're going to find yourself putting little tabs and marking up and folding corners of important pages uh, because our industry has been over the years, there's no denying the fact that there was, and there, there, there still is, whether you uh, want to admit it or not, there is still racism within the real estate uh, community. Not to say that real estate agents are that way, but to say that it's been like this for a very long time. And Richard, I was watching your video that the Now This channel made uh, about you last night, um, which I thought was incredible, it has like almost a million views. And I would like you to start with public housing. Let's, I want to talk about public housing because what, what you, when you talked about public housing in that video, there's a big misconception about what it started out as and what it was meant for and what it turned into. And I just thought it was just fascinating because people think of public housing as like the projects, but that wasn't all, that wasn't what it was meant for. Can we talk about that for a little bit? Sure. You're, you're absolutely right, Nick. The, um, Public housing for civilians, of course, we've always had housing on military bases, but the first government housing for civilians was created uh, during the Depression, uh, the New Deal, the Roosevelt administration. It was not for poor people. Poor people weren't even admitted into public housing when it was created. Uh, we had a 25% unemployment rate uh, during the Depression, but public housing was for the 75% who had jobs and stable incomes who could afford to rent housing, but um, no housing was available because there was so little construction activity going on. So the, the New Deal began building public housing for working class families, people who had jobs. Uh, I, I wanna say also as background, we're talking about the 1930s and the early 20th century when we had many, many integrated neighborhoods in downtown areas of this country. We would be stunned if we were transported back to that country that time in history to see the extent of non-segregation that existed. It was that way for a simple reason, and that is that we were a manufacturing economy. Uh, none of this internet stuff going on. We were had factories, we were making things, and factories needed to be located 
in a central area near either a deep water port or a railroad terminal so that they could get their parts or ship their products by rail or by ship. So, and, and workers didn't have automobiles. So working class families, uh, middle class families, not just the factory workers, but the people who worked in the banks that served those factories and other service industries all lived in the same general area. I'm not suggesting that every other house was, was black or white, but broadly integrated neighborhoods uh, in which, from which people walked to work. They didn't have cars to get there. So the Public Works Administration began building public housing for these workers who had jobs. Uh, and everywhere the Public Works Administration built this housing, it segregated it, creating separate projects for whites, separate projects for African Americans, frequently uh, creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. You know, we know, we think of the South as being a segregated place. It's true that uh, Atlanta had uh, segregated schools and segregated water fountains and segregated buses and segregated restaurants. It had integrated neighborhoods for the reason that I was just uh, describing. The very first public housing project in this country was built in a neighborhood near downtown Atlanta called the Flats. Uh, integrated neighborhood is about half white, half black. The Public Works Administration demolished housing in that neighborhood and created a project for whites only, forcing the African-Americans who were living in that neighborhood to find less adequate housing elsewhere, double, triple up with relatives. Uh, the great African-American poet, novelist, playwright Langston Hughes describes in his autobiography how he grew up in an integrated Cleveland downtown neighborhood. It's not the way we think of Cleveland downtown today, but he lived in an area called the central neighborhood of Cleveland. It was about half white and half black. He says he, in high school, his best friend was Polish, said he dated a Jewish girl in high school. Not surprising, it was an integrated high school and an integrated neighborhood. But the Public Works Administration went into that neighborhood and built two separate projects, one for whites, one for African-Americans, creating a pattern of segregation uh, that, uh, with that and other projects elsewhere in Cleveland that were also segregated that persists to this day. Uh, in my book, uh, Nick, as you may know, uh, uh, I like where I can to um, describe self-satisfied smug places that think they're better than every place else. Uh, one of them is uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Maybe you've heard of it. <laughs> the area between uh, Harvard and MIT, the Central Square neighborhood, was a fully integrated neighborhood in the 1930s, but the Public Works Administration demolished housing there, and the federal government built two projects, one for whites, one for African-Americans, creating a pattern of segregation where it hadn't previously existed. Let me give you one other uh, uh, kind of example about this. It's uh, uh, during World War II, the uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of workers flocked to uh, centers of war production to take jobs in war industries. So there hadn't been many jobs available in the depression and World War II built up the economy for the first time. And these uh, migrant workers coming to work in war industries, both black and white, overwhelmed the communities uh, where these war plants were located. And if the federal government wanted the ships and the planes and the jeeps and the tanks to be produced, it had to find housing for these workers. So it did. It built housing projects, public housing projects for war workers everywhere where there's a war plant and everywhere it segregated it creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. A um, good example of this is the West Coast. Uh, I, I, I think some of you are, are from there. Um, up and down the West Coast. Okay, <laughs> Shanique is from, from the West Coast, I see. Um, you know, the, the, they were, there had been very few African-Americans living on the West Coast before World War II. It was, um, historians divide up the migration of African-Americans out of the former slave states into the rest of the country into two per periods. The first mi great migration around World War I, also to take jobs in, in war plants, ammunition plants at that time, uh, brought uh, black families and workers to the East and the Midwest, but not to the West Coast. It wasn't until World War II that uh, significant numbers of African-Americans uh, came from Louisiana and Texas and Arkansas to um, uh, take jobs in war plants in the West Coast. And the government, like I said, had to find housing for them. And it did, it created segregated housing for workers in the same war plants. Uh, it created separate projects for blacks and whites. Uh, in San Francisco, uh, the government built uh, five public housing projects for war workers, 
Four were for whites only, one for African-Americans placed in the Fillmore District that then became the black neighborhood of San Francisco. Similarly, the war project um, in Los Angeles was placed in Watts, and that became the black neighborhood of, San of Los Angeles. And the same thing happened in Portland and Seattle up and down the West Coast. That's how it came to be segregated. It had not been segregated before these projects. So there's much more to say about this. Uh, I'll stop rather than monopolizing the conversation, but that's an example of the kind of policy that the federal government and then local state, um, local uh, state uh, housing authorities and local housing authorities followed to create segregation in this country. Let me just say this one final thing about it. You know, we have a myth in this country, a rationalization that we give ourselves uh, to excuse ourselves from confronting the fact that we are so residentially segregated. And that myth is that we have something called de facto segregation, just something that sort of happened by accident because, oh, people like to live with each other at the same race or private businesses like real estate agencies or banks or uh, developers uh, created uh, uh, segregation. Uh, it's an other myth. Uh, we have an unconstitutional system of residential segregation created by racially explicit public policies uh, at the federal, state, and local level. I've just described one of them. There are many, many others. I love it. Shaniqua, you, you had a question you wanted to interject here. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the areas that you discussed in your book is where I play. Um, from a real estate practitioner perspective. Um, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area by way of Oakland. And you talked about West Oakland. You talked about Richmond. Um, here recently, I was telling Tristan and Nick before we got on that I actually placed a Black family in the Rolling Woods to, um, area of uh, Richmond. And when we got the keys to their home, they received a handwritten note from the seller saying that we were one of the first Black families here and we're happy and elated that we are able to transfer this home to another Black family so they can continue creating memories in this home. Uh, and so when I actually uh, uh, gave them the keys, I also gave them a copy of your book so they knew the significance of actually what they did. Um, and, and that really kind of resonated with them and, and really um, made me warm with joy because this is kind of what we do. Um, this is how we, we combat um, a lot of the, the inequities that we see today. Um, my question to you is this, is I was actually watching this documentary about one of our former presidents um, the other day on Showtime. And they're having a series on um, some of the, the previous presidents in the United States. And one of the things that I found really interesting is I knew that there was a lot of work to fight the Fair Housing Act in the state of California. And a lot of people don't think that California, because they automatically think it's, it's very liberal, they don't think that there was a movement to stop fair housing in the state of California. And a lot of ways that they uh, monopolized that was using it to say, hey, I should have the right as a private citizen to sell whoever I wanted to. So can you kind of talk about how um, policy was, was leveraged on a state and local level to, to continue the work that the federal government did? Sure, and, and Shanika, I'm gonna do this in a somewhat different way than you think. I'm gonna go back to your example in Richmond because one of the local policies that uh, were used to uh, create, reinforce and sustain racial segregation was state-sponsored violence. That is government-sponsored violence to drive African-Americans out of homes that they had legitimately purchased or rented in white neighborhoods. And there were hundreds and hundreds of these cases. One of these was in the Rollingwood um, section of Richmond that you're talking about. And I, I describe in, in my book, I think it was in 1954 that the first uh, black family bought a home in that uh, community of Rollingwood outside of Richmond. A chapter nine, Richard, chapter nine. Okay, well, you know the book better than I do. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've read it. <laughs> um, you know, in, the, the family moved into that uh, home and a uh, mob, an angry white mob, um, protected by the police, and this is the key issue, protected by the police, um, assaulted the home, 
uh, spent, I think, three months or four months blaring music every night um, from next door neighbor's house into that home. Police made no effort to stop it. Um, a, uh, and um, this was a 14th Amendment violation. It was a constitutional violation uh, for the police to uh, enforce segregation in that way. And this was not an unusual situation. There were hundreds and hundreds of examples of this, of mob violence protected by the police, frequently organized and led by police to ensure that African-Americans could not uh, remain in homes that they had legitimately purchased or rented in white neighborhoods uh, or previously, previously white neighborhoods. Every one of these was a constitutional violation, a civil rights violation that every one of us as American citizens have an obligation to remedy, but we've never remedied any of them. So I'm, I'm delighted to learn that uh, uh, African-Americans can now live in Rollingwood, uh, but uh, the history there, and, and there's a, a book, um, another book, not mine, but there's a book by um, Jessica, Jessica Mitford, a, a, um, uh, who, who is a, a left-wing uh, activist uh, you may know she's written, she wrote a book about the American way of death, about the funeral industry, a well-known journalist. She wrote a book called a fine, old Conf a fine Old Conflict. And she describes how she, as a member of a civil rights group, um, had uh, went to Rollingwood and uh, had to establish, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, defense committees to try to protect the family from the violence that the police were encouraging in a place like Rollingwood. So this is a, another example of state-sponsored uh, violence. I can talk about other policies as well that went on at the state and local level, uh, but that's, uh, again, I, I can do it as time goes on, but I want to monopolize the conversation. That's one example. It went from federal policy down to very, very local policy. I well, that. I remember there's one uh, example in the book um, where you mention Anne Braden uh, and her husband, who they were a white couple, and they sold their home to a black couple. Well, they didn't sell their home. They had a friend. Oh, sorry. and they bought a second home in their all white community to sell okay, gotcha. to, to the black family because nobody else would sell them one. And that story um, really gave me chills down my spine can you talk about can you just tell that story for us because that i think is another example of state-sponsored violence sure well actually that's the uh, as you may know if you read the, the the book carefully that's how i came to this topic was but that incident was from that incident because um in 2007 the supreme court uh considered a um a, a policy that was had been implemented by two school districts one was Seattle, Washington, and the other was Louisville, Kentucky. And both of those districts had a very, very token uh, school desegregation plan where they gave parents the choice of which school their child would attend within the district. But if the choice was going to further intensify segregation, it wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a, a parent whose child wouldn't do that. And so if you had an all white, a mostly white school, and there was one place left and a black and a white child, uh, both applied for that last place, the um, uh, black child would be given some preference. It was a trivial program. You don't have one place left in the school very often and both a black and a white child apply for it. But the Supreme Court denounced it. Uh, the controlling opinion was written by Chief Justice John Roberts. Uh, uh, Justice Roberts said that it's true that the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated, but he said they're segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. He was absolutely right about that. Uh, that's why we have so much uh, school segregation in the country today. In fact, schools are more segregated today than at any time in the last 45 years in this country because neighborhood segregation is so intensified. And uh, the Chief Justice said that the, the neighborhoods are, are segregated de facto. This myth I talked to you about before, government had nothing to do with it. And Robert said that um, it's, uh, if, if uh, the government hasn't created segregation, then it's against the constitution for the government to do anything to undo it. Well, I read this decision and that's what um, made me remember reading about this case that uh, you just mentioned, Nick, and that is in Louisville, Kentucky, one of these two, uh, two cities that Chief Justice John Roberts said were de facto segregated. 
And we've already talked about this, a, a white homeowner, an all-white suburb, had an African-American friend living in the center of city of Louisville. Uh, he uh, uh, had a wife and child, wanted to move to a single family home. Nobody would sell him one. So the white family, Carl and Ann Braden that you, you just mentioned, uh, bought a second home in their community, resold it to their African-American friend. And when the African-American family moved in, an angry mob surrounded the home, protected by the police, just like in Rollingwood. They threw rocks through the windows. They uh, dynamited and firebombed the home. The police made no effort to stop this. But when the riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence, Carl Braden, the white homeowner, uh, for sedition for having sold a home in a white neighborhood to a black family. And I read this, uh, having read the Supreme Court decision, I said to myself, you know, there's something that Chief Justice John Roberts doesn't know about the history of Louisville. If he thinks this is de facto segregation, just something that happened by accident. The police in Louisville, in that instance, and I said there were hundreds and hundreds of examples like this, and I mentioned a few others in the book as well, uh, uh, enforced racial segregation in violation of their 14th Amendment obligations. <clears throat> that, that story just like when I read that, um, you know, and by the way, it doesn't sound so much different than some of the things that are still going on. Like the ones who got arrested were the were not the ones inciting actually inciting the violence. They were the ones who were accused of inciting the violence, right? Like that story just blew my mind. I know Ann Braden wrote a book too about it and I, I can't recall the name of it. The Wall um, Between. The Wall Between. That story is just, just. Um, I, I grew up in Montclair, New Jersey. That's why I mentioned on the cover of the book is Essex County. And it's a very, very diverse, culturally, uh, very culturally diverse town, 10 miles west of Midtown Manhattan. Um, you know, my next door neighbor was black. My uh, neighbor across the street was Hispanic. And it was just like this great, amazing melting pot. And now I'm in <laughs> Michigan <laughs> in not the most diverse area, but I, you know, that's kind of, that's how I grew up. So reading those stories, just, I just get that's, so angry. That's to the heart of it. Richard, we have a few people who just ordered the book. They're excited. So I love that. And let me ask you a question, because you've done some really deep research in this book. I mean, the, the bibliography is 25 pages long. So yeah, the book uh, itself, it's insane, the book right? is like 400 pages, but then then the the, the, yeah, the bibliography is like 100 pages. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. So Richard, have you gotten much pushback? Like, for example, uh, you're going to get people that say, well, that's not true. Where's the evidence? Like, right. Th th this isn't taking isn't place anymore, right? So do you get people like that? And and what, what why do you think they do that, if so? Well, actually, I don't, because as you say, the facts uh, are so impregnable. Uh, I, uh, you know, we have this national myth, as I said, we uh, the subtitle of the book is a forgotten history of how our government segregated America. It's not that yeah. this wasn't well known, but we have, have collectively decided to... Um, implement amnesia about uh, the unconstitutional nature of these racial boundaries. And the reason I, I included that um, extensive bibliography and spent so much time uh, documenting carefully all of the examples that we talked about so far and many others that we haven't talked about is because I wanted to um, ensure that uh, nobody would challenge facts. and. Um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, I'm not a professional historian, but uh, no uh, historian has challenged uh, a single fact in this book. Uh, the only fact that was an error in the first edition is I misnamed the school district. The story I told about it was correct, but I misnamed the school district. That was corrected for the paperback edition. And uh, not a single fact has been uh, challenged um, in this book. Um, I call it a forgotten history. Uh, as you know, one of the things that um, I, I talk about in the book is I, I spend some pages reviewing the textbooks that are used to teach American history in high schools everywhere in this country. And uh, I reviewed them, uh, all the mo most commonly used ones. Every one of them lies about this history. Uh, they um, uh, talk about, uh, we started out by talking about public housing. The textbooks talk about how the Public Works Administration 
uh, built housing in the depression uh, for people who were without housing, who could afford it, but the workers didn't have it. Never once, none of these textbooks mentioned that it was on a segregated basis. Uh, the textbooks um, brag, they, have, they usually devote several pages to the wonderful work that the federal government, this is something we haven't talked about yet, the wonderful work that the federal government did in um, suburbanizing the country and creating suburbs where working families uh, could live, never mentioning that the federal government had an explicit policy to create these suburbs for white families only and prohibit African Americans from moving into them. So, um, you know, what I say in the book, and I think this is true, is um, uh, if the next generation doesn't learn this history any better than we have, they're going to be in this poor position to remedy it as we've been. And uh, I'm actually um, involved in a, um, an effort of a, a group of national civil rights leaders to create something we call a national committee to redress racial segregation. Um, and its um, goal is to create local committees. We're going to hire uh, organizers to go into local communities to uh, create local civil rights groups. And uh, one of the first things that uh, these groups can do is challenge their local school districts who are misteaching wow. this history. And Richard. we've created, uh, yeah, we've created yeah. a curriculum unit they can use. And we've created, the, there's a 17 minute video mm -hmm. for high school students that uh, we, we've created. And um, that's, that should be the first thing that a local civil rights group does on these issues. I love that. Can you, uh, on or off later, uh, we'd love to help with that to spread it out because our community is so large with real estate agents. I don't see why some real estate agents can't take this on as something that they push. So if you want to send us that information after, we can definitely help with pushing that. I will. Well, uh, that's 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 great, Tristan. What um uh what it'll be a month or two until we announce publicly the launch of it. We just hired a uh. A, someone to create the website and to uh, do the initial work of, of looking for um, field organizers that we're going to hire. But um, I can um, uh, set up a way that you can, any of, any of your real estate agents or anybody else who's watching this webinar today uh, gets on the list to receive that notification. And what we're gonna do is we want people when they do that to tell us what city and town they live in so that we can put people together in local communities to create the base of this new civil rights group. Hey, Richard, I, I just want to say one thing because it's kind of along the lines of what you were just talking about with the government. And there is also a question that uh, I want to segue into um, from Andrew, who's leaving a, a question in the chat. In, in On chapter five, in the mid 20th century, uh, where it says property owners and builders had created segregated environments by including language both in individual home deeds and in packs among neighbors that prohibited future resales to African Americans. The FHA went along with this, even though it was clearly unconstitutional. And in Detroit, I'm in the Detroit area now, from 1943 to 1965, that's not that long ago, white homeowners, real estate agents, and developers organized 192 associations to preserve racial exclusion. So this leads me to this question from Andrew. Why was it in the federal government's interest to promote segregation uh, in public housing and in this type of situation? And what did they gain from it? Well, um, I think maybe I should describe the program first, and then I, I can answer that question. Okay. Um, the federal government embarked on a program, I alluded to this earlier, to suburbanize the white working class, lower middle class population into single family homes in all white suburbs. Uh, this was uh, re reached its greatest intensity in the immediate post-World War II period when these suburbs were created for returning war veterans. Um, the most famous of these probably is Levittown, although they exist in uh, east of New York City, but they're in every metropolitan area. Some of you are in, in California, you know places like Westlake and Daly City or, uh, well, Rollingwood is one of them, uh, created by the federal government for whites only, explicitly for whites only. Um, you know, a, a builder like Levitt um, uh, could never have assembled the capital 
to uh, buy the land and build homes for 17,000 families. That's how large Levittown was. But, you know, Westlake and Daly City was 15,000. Uh, uh, Westchester out, uh, outside Los Angeles is also about 15,000. Lakewood uh, near Long Beach, California is about the same size. And everywhere in between, um, there were both large and small uh, developments like this created. Levitt, as I say, could never, or any of these other developers, could never have assembled the capital to uh, buy the homes, build the, uh, buy the land. The only way they could do it was by going to the Federal Housing Administration and in the World War II period, uh, uh, the uh, Veterans Administration, uh, submitting their plans for the pro projects, uh, uh, the architectural designs they were going to use, the um, uh, material, construction materials, uh, the layout of the streets, all the details, plus an explicit commitment required by the federal government never to sell a home to an African-American. In this case of Levittown and in many others, uh, the federal government even required the deeds that you're talking about uh, to have language prohibiting resale to African-Americans or rental to African-Americans. And you know, you're all real estate agents, uh, uh, as you know, you can't change your deed once something is in it. You can't wake up in the middle of the night and say, I want my property line to be different. You know, a deed is a deed. This language is still there. And if any of you live in homes that were built uh, in the mid 20th century before about 1950, look at your deeds. You'll see you're probably living in a home that was for Caucasians only by deed. Well, this was not the action of rogue bureaucrats. And this gets to your question. It was not simply a, a, a bigoted action by rogue bureaucrats working in the FHA and VA. It was written policy in uh, what the FHA termed its, its underwriting manual. It was a manual distributed to appraisers all over the country whose job it was to evaluate the applications of builders, and developers uh, for federal guarantees for their bank loans to build these subdivisions, these suburban communities. Uh, the, the manual explicitly said that you could not recommend for a federal bank guarantee a development that was going to be non-segregated. The manual went so far as to say you couldn't even um, build a, uh, a, a guarantee a bank loan to build a project that was gonna be for whites only if it was going to be located near where African-Americans were living. Because in the words of the manual, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's what the federal manual said. Yet we have this notion of de facto segregation. It's utter nonsense. Nick, you live in um, Detroit, you said. Um, in, in my book, as you probably I live, know. Uh, about, I live about 60 minutes north of Detroit, yeah. Okay. All right, well, in, in, in the book, uh, In the Color of Law, I have a photograph of a six foot high, half mile long concrete wall that a builder just outside Detroit was required by the federal government to construct in order to have a federal bank guarantee um, for his project, because that wall was going to um, keep African-Americans from walking into the community because they live too close, uh, according to um, uh, the Federal Housing Administration. So what was their motivation? I don't think they had any legitimate motivation. Um, you know, we've never in this country uh, confronted the legacies of slavery uh, the uh, uh, what uh, Isabel Wilkerson in a new book calls the caste system into which we've placed African Americans, and the uh, federal government was implementing uh, that attitude. It was blatantly unconstitutional, but that didn't stop them. And um, uh, I don't think you can find any justification. You know, sometimes they said, you know, people said, well, uh, it's necessary to keep black families out of these neighborhoods because property values will decline if they live there. The Federal Housing Administration knew that was nonsense. Uh, uh, they, the, their own economists uh, documented the fact that property values actually rose when African Americans uh, moved into a uh, neighborhood uh, for the simple reason that if you, you know, it's simple economics one-on-one, -on -one, as they say, if because African Americans' uh, supply of housing was so constricted relative to whites, they were willing to pay more for housing than whites were for of similar quality. So if there was a white homeowner who wanted to sell his home, uh, I know, her home, his home, uh, maybe get a job in a different city or have a bigger family and wanted to move to a different home, it was to that homeowner's advantage to sell to an African-American rather than to a white because uh, the black family would pay more 
They, they had so few choices. So it was well known that the property values did not decline when blacks moved in. Um, they only rose. And frequently it was, uh, it was the case, and you know, I talk about this a little bit in the book as well, you know, if you had a neighborhood with one or two black families, you could drive through and tell where the black families lived because the, the homes were better kept up. They were uh, um, you know, more uh, remodeling done. Um, uh, this, was, uh, this was characteristic. Now, then what happened is when black families moved into a neighborhood, typically real estate agents um, created a panic among white home buyers based on this myth that their property values would decline. Uh, this was a, a something called blockbusting. Uh, real estate agents would go into the uh, uh, community, uh, tell white families that blacks were moving in, that they better sell quick because their property values would decline if they didn't leave. Uh, in The Color of Law, I report on a, uh, uh, a magazine interview with a, uh, one of these speculators who um, arranged burglaries in the neighborhood once a black family moved in to persuade white neighbors that their uh, neighborhood was going to deteriorate. They hired uh, black women to walk through the neighborhood pushing baby carriages. They uh, hired a, a, a black uh, 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 sounding um, women to uh, call up random people in the neighborhood and ask, is Johnny May there? Um, that kind of thing to create this panic. And when they did that, the homeowners would um, uh, panic and sell their homes to these realtors, to these speculators at below market rates. And the realtors and speculators would then turn around and resell them to African-Americans for above market rates. Um, this was, I say, called blockbusting. And it's how white flight was subsidized uh, by the, the real estate industry. Now, I, I emphasize in the book always that this is an unconstitutional system because this was a practice that was tolerated and sanctioned by the licensing agencies in every state that license real estate agencies and, and agents and realtors. Uh, as you know, as you may know, in the um, uh, 20th century, up until the mid 1950s, I think it was, the National Association of Realtors, it had, I think it was called the Real, real Estate Boards at that time, the name that's now the name of the organization of, for, for African-American realtors, but the National Association of Realtors had a code of ethics that prohibited real estate agents from selling homes to African-Americans in white neighborhoods. Every time a state licensed a real estate agent who subscribed to that code of ethics, who was a member of the National Association of Realtors, that state was violating the 14th Amendment to go to another example of state action that Shanika asked about before. So this is a to totally unconstitutional system. And um, Well, that, that leads me to my next question. So this was a very timely segue into the, the participation of the real estate community. And I'm gonna ask a very brave question here because a lot of times people's definition of freedom is the freedom to discriminate. And what we found in having a lot of these conversations just here in lab code agents is there's a lot of people that feel like they're not part of the problem or the problem does not exist. And what I know as a real estate practitioner is, is just because you don't think what you're doing is biased doesn't mean it's not. So what can we do to improve our current culture in the real estate community so we can be on the on the side of solution and not the problem. Well, before you answer that, Richard, I just want to say thank you to Shaniqua for asking that question, because yes, with 130,000 plus members, we see some agents who just don't want to admit that these things happened and that they still do happen. And you just have to come to terms with it. And if you keep denying it, you're just encouraging the problem. That's just my two cents. So I appreciate that you brought that up. Well, in answer to your question, uh, Shanika, you know, I always emphasize, as you can tell from what I've said so far, the uh, state sponsorship of this system, because that's what creates the civil rights violation. So you're right. Maybe people have a right privately to discriminate. Uh, the Fair Housing Act prohibits it, but maybe the Fair Housing Act is wrong. 
it's infringing on individual rights. But when the state licensing agency licenses a real estate agent who discriminates or who tolerates the discrimination of his or her clients, a civil rights violation is being committed. So go ahead, um, uh, discriminate if you want, but not with a state license that permits you to operate uh, under those circumstances. So that's the first, first response um, you know, I have to it. What can real estate agents do now? Well, uh, I'm sure every one of you is familiar because everybody in the real estate age, uh, industry is with the um, uh, Long Island Newsday um, report of about a year ago that conclusively demonstrated the extent of continuing um, uh, discriminatory behavior on the part of some section of the real estate industry. Are you familiar with that? Can I assume that everybody knows that? Yes. That Long Island Newsday? Okay. The reason that's so uh, powerful is because uh, in New York, unlike many states, uh, there's no law requiring two-way consent to record a conversation. So Long Island Newsday was able to, to um, uh, fit their testers, that is blacks and whites with uh, identical financial records and other uh, observable characteristics, fit their testers with hidden cameras. Uh, in, in, in many states, you can't do that without telling uh, the person that you're filming them but they fitted their testers with hidden cameras and they posted courageously online, uh, linked to the newspaper's report, uh, 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 videos of, of realtors telling people that they didn't wanna go to these certain communities because they were African-American um, engaging in explicit racial steering. Uh, we've done, uh, the federal government occasionally does audit studies of, uh, uh, to enforce the Fair Housing Act, in which they send these matched pair testers, black and white, uh, to um, uh, real estate agents to either buy homes or, or perhaps rental agencies to rent homes. And they document that statistically, this is a significant um, share of uh, uh, real estate agents who continue to discriminate in this way, continue to steer black families to black neighborhoods, white families to white neighborhoods. Um, the problem with these audit studies is they don't name perpetrators. All they do is publish statistics. And you can't um, uh, clean up your own industry if you don't know who the bad apples are. So one thing that I've been recommending, I'm working uh, closely with the National Association of Realtors with a number of these recommendations. But one thing I've been recommending is that the uh, real estate industry set up its own testing program in cooperation with a, with a civil rights group, the Fair Housing, the National Fair Housing Alliance would be a good one. A joint um, independent agency uh, run, sponsored with board members, both from the National Association of Realtors and from the National Fair Housing Alliance to conduct audit studies like this. Of course, they can't use cameras in most states, but they can still uh, identify just as the, the the federal uh, investigations do identify perpetrators uh, and um, um, run out of the industry uh, agents who uh, continue to practice this kind of discriminatory behavior. That's one thing that can be done. It, it could be an independent agency. Local real estate boards could contract with this agency to, um, in, to investigate, the, to do audit studies of their um, uh, community. Uh, I, I think the real estate industry has an obligation to clean up its own act in this way. Another thing that uh, I'm working with uh, NAR on, and um, it's a tough thing to, to crack, and that is that um, the use, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we have so much more segregation now than we used to in this country is because uh, the real estate industry uses great schools and Zillow and some of these other agencies to identify the quality of a community by the test scores of their schools. Every student of education, every sociologist knows that test scores are not a valid indicator of the quality of schools. If you think about it, what makes a good school? What makes a good school is a well-rounded curriculum. What makes a good school is um, uh, 
whether it's diverse, whether it's preparing children to succeed in the 21st century in a diverse society. Uh, what test scores indicate primarily is the uh, educational and economic background of the parents of children in school. And uh, the NAR realizes this, uh, Zillow and great schools realize this, but they have not come up with an alternative. And so long as they tell parents and families looking for homes that uh, this is a good community to be in because it has high test scores, what they are doing is reinforcing segregation and giving incentives uh, to people to move to more segregated communities. So that's another thing that needs to be uh, dealt with. Um, real estate agents uh, need to stop, even uh, though we can't uh, yet reform Zillow and great schools, need to stop um, using these test scores to tell parents um, that the, a community is a good one. And then uh, I recently wrote an article, um, it was about, well, three months now ago in the New York Times about uh, which I focused on a community in uh, Northern California in a community called San Mateo, a neighborhood called Hillsdale. Uh, this is an all white neighborhood uh, created by the FHA uh, in the um, uh, early 1940s. Homes then sold as in Levittown and all these others I talked about for about $100,000 in today's money. Uh, those homes now sell for a million dollars. They're unaffordable to African-Americans who would have been able to afford them had they been permitted to buy them. Well, in this article, I described this community and identified the developer, the bank, and the real estate agency that cooperated with the federal housing agency and created this all white segregated community. And they all exist today or their successors exist today and what I said in this uh, article, and I'll be glad to send that to you and you can circulate it to people uh, you know, who are watching this uh, webinar. What I said in this article uh, is um, that uh, the a local civil rights group in that community should be pressing that real estate agency. And it's a major national real estate agency, real estate company. Uh, that real estate agency, that bank, that developer, to create a fund, you can call it a voluntary reparations fund if you want, to uh, help undo the damage that it did by a fund that subsidizes African Americans to move into a community that's otherwise unaffordable to them. Uh, I know I wasn't supposed to do this, but I just glanced at the chat and um, I saw somebody say that they want to um, uh, direct families to the extent they can to high quality neighborhoods because they have diverse schools. And that's something that I hope the real estate industry can start to do. That's the, that's the uh, mark of a high quality neighborhood. Oh, that's great. True. That's great. I mean, listen, we can talk about this stuff all day long. Tristan, I think we're going to have to have Richard back at some point because the chat is just going crazy. There's so many things to talk about. I have a million more questions. So we're gonna to have to have you back if you'd come back at some point. Be glad to. Yeah, Richard, if you stay any longer, I'm gonna to have to get a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, do, you have, do you have enough there for two glasses? Can you give me one? <laughs> How about three? <laughs> That's funny. Um, there's so many fascinating, I, I don't know if fascinating is the right word, but I, I think fascinating in the sense that you know, so much of this stuff, like you said, isn't taught in the history books. And I think that's why uh, people have a hard time. Maybe it's not that they don't believe it. They have a hard time wrapping their brains around that this could have, that this could happen and it did happen, right? That's, that's, I think, where a lot of it comes from. You know, agents say, I don't know any agent who's done these things, but think about it. There's 2 million realtors. You know, you surround yourself with maybe like 10 or 20. So if you don't know any who's done it, that's great. But it, it over time, you know, oh, it was only until 1950 where it, it, if you sold a, a, a black family, a house in a white neighborhood, you would have your license revoked. And that was before an R. That was the National, National Association of Brokers or something. But this stuff is mind blowing when you when you when you read about it. It's it's really incredible, you know. It's very so. true. And, and Richard, look, we want to respect your time. So next time you come on, we'd love to talk about 
probably some solutions as well. So we can get into that. And I, I think that that would really open up our, our minds to his real estate agents. So, well, can I say something about that, Tristan, yeah. for a minute? Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm now working on a new book on solutions, but the theme of the book is this, the solutions are well known. They may not be well known to the general public, but the housing experts know what the solutions to this are. What's missing, as I said before, is a new civil rights movement that's going to um, create the political environment where these solutions can be implemented. And that's where my focus is, uh, because we know what to do. We know how to do it. Um, what's missing is, is uh, the political environment where these solutions are implemented. And that's why I'm spending so much time um, helping this group with, called the National uh, Committee to Redress Racial Segregation to get launched. I love it. That's well. We want to do our best to help you out, Richard, and you can use our forum to, to push this. So any way we can do that, email us and let us know. We'll be happy to, to continue to grow this relationship with you. So thank for you sure. for coming on, Richard. Yeah, when we send out the recording, you'll send out the link to the book and all those things. Yep. And that article, I got the article as well. I posted it up there. So we'll also send that as well. So Thank you for being on Shaniqua. Thank you for that awesome connection to- This to has Richard. been a treat. This is like a dream come true. <laughs> I can do this all day. <laughs> yeah, and then Nick, Nick just showcased that book there as well. So be sure to get your book and Richard will love to have you for part two. We'll coordinate that. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being with you. Thank, thank you. Thank you everybody. Thanks Richard, have a great day. Thanks.